Right, hello everyone. Welcome to our third RAP lecture on RF mixers. We'll get started. Um, so I say here, review second assignment. I think we'll actually move the deadline of the second assignment back. And I don't know exactly which day, but it'll be moved back. So I won't cover the second assignment in this lecture. We'll do it next time. But after that, we'll talk about mixers and all of that fun stuff. So mixers. So the ideal mixer essentially multiplies two signals together. And we, we kind of talked about what use that has in our communication system, mainly for up conversion and down conversion. And I'll review again the mechanism of how that works. And so there's this term you might hear called super heterodyning or heterodyning, either one. And the idea with super heterodyning is that you receive a high frequency signal uh, on your antenna or something that's like a you know, radio transmission or something like that. And you down convert that to a lower frequency called an intermediate frequency or IF using a mixer. And you might ask, what's the purpose of that? And uh, you have to consider when there's kind of multiple purposes. One is, uh, suppose you want to receive a range of frequencies, like a, let's say you're receiving FM radio. And FM radio spans multiple channels. Like you might have 94.7 the wave. And you might have uh, KUSC for your classical music. And those are different frequencies, 94.7 megahertz. So those are megahertz. And uh, if you were to down convert that with a single mixer, and, or sorry, if you did not down convert that, you would have to filter out the frequency band you're interested in, like the specific radio station you're interested in, and uh, demodulate that. Uh, like filtered radio station. But one of the problems is that uh, you're, it's not easy to have a movable filter. So like, for example, if I, if uh, let's say I have one radio station at frequency F1, I have another radio station at frequency F2, and I might want to listen to F, uh, F1, I filter out F1, so I get rid of F2, and I demodulate that uh, that uh, station. But now I want to listen to F2. I'd have to move this filter response to F2, and that's not easy to do in a circuit. It's not easy to create a um, like a movable variable filter. So what can we do instead? Well. Let's say we uh, multiply or down convert whatever we receive, F1 and F2, to a lower frequency. So we'll take both of these and we'll shift them down to some lower frequency. We'll call that F10 uh, and F20. And now I can do the same filtering thing. So I filter out F10, I get rid of F2, and I can demodulate F10. Now you might ask, what's the point? We have the same problem. Well, the question is, what is F10 and F20? Well, when we down convert, remember that our FIF, the uh, intermediate frequency, is equal to FLO minus. FRF, absolute value. And if I can vary FLO, and it turns out I can, which is the uh, local oscillator frequency, and FRF is F1 and F2, then I can basically move where F10 and F20 are. And if I move them to the right location, I can place F10 uh, within this filter or I can increase FLO, FLO a little, or uh, rather decrease it a little, 
and I can move F20 into this filter response. So I can keep the filter static. So it's filtering out the same frequency, but I can move where I'm down converting these RF signals to. So hopefully that makes a little sense. Um, and then, so that, that, that's essentially kind of what we're gonna be doing with this, uh, uh, this communication system, but we're only gonna be receiving one thing and we're just gonna be down converting it. So the other reason you might use a mixer, sometimes you're using what's called a phase lock loop. We're not gonna really be talking about phase lock loops here. Uh, so just, just a, a word to remember. All right, so like, like I said, we're gonna be using it for mixers for up conversion and for down conversion. So on the transmitter side, the PX, we're gonna be up converting the output from the DAC, which is a lower frequency to that 27 megahertz transmit frequency. And on the receiver or the RX, we're going to be down converting what we receive, the 27 megahertz, to a lower frequency such that we can sample it. Though, if you do things right, I say you, you may not need this step. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the uh, digital sampling lecture, which is to come later. So, uh, just a review of how this up conversion and down conversion stuff works. So, remember, if you multiply two sinusoidal signals, uh, we get, so here's sinusoidal signal one, signal two. And when we multiply them, we get a sum frequency and a different frequency. And so let's say this guy here is your LO, your local oscillator, which is a single frequency. And this guy here really represents your RF signal, which really has a bandwidth. And so that's what, um, if I look at the up conversion thing here, that's what these guys represent, uh, that the signals have really have a bandwidth, they're not a single frequency. But when we multiply them by the LO, we're moving both of these guys down here. So we do, uh, uh, they would both like an FLO minus, um, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one here. Uh, oops. Let me scratch that. I should be looking at the down conversion. Here, I, I receive the RF signal, which is this guy. I multiply it by the LO, and that goes down here to the IF frequency. Now, the opposite is true for the up conversion. We take our IF signal, and we multiply it by the LO, and we get our uh, difference we can see here in the sum frequency. So hopefully you all remember that. Uh, okay, so now there, there's some problems uh, with doing this. And some of them might be readily obvious, some of them might not be. But here's one of the one of the most important. So suppose I have a, an LO frequency, which is this blue guy here. This, this is the LO. And I have my desired RF frequency with its bandwidth that I'm receiving on an antenna. And so that's a FRF, which is right here. And suppose I have another signal that I'm receiving, but it, it, it's not in something that I want. It's a kind of an interference from other transmitters around the area. And that might be at a frequency called F image that I have here. And suppose that FLO minus F image is pretty close to FLO minus FRF. In this case, they're both equal to roughly FIF. And so you can kind of see the problem here. When we do this multiplication, um, they'll both end up pretty close to the same frequency, they'll be on top of each other. And we'll have no way of uh, discerning one from the other, at least in the frequency domain. So, and then we might filter out, uh, or uh, at least after we do this down conversion, we'll apply a band pass filter to filter out the uh, sum frequency. Remember you have both difference and sum, so we'll filter out the sum which is what this 
IF filter is doing. But because this green guy, which is the image uh, frequency, is so close to the RF frequency, that bandpass filter can't uh, really filter out that green interference. And so this is what we call the image frequency. And uh, the question is, how do we avoid this? And it's kind of simple, actually. I wrote it right here. You add a filter to the RF input. So what you do before mixing is that you always apply a band test filter, or at least a high pass or low pass filter, but ideally band test filter, such that you, you uh, allow your RF frequency to pass through to the mixer and you filter out this image frequency. So when we get to actually using these mixers, we'll need to do the same thing. We'll need to design a bandpass filter to filter out or get, get rid of this image frequency and leaving the frequencies of interest. I have a question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Wait, so you applied the, so if you're able to apply the filter to the RF input, mm -hmm. um, why could you not apply a filter? Uh, so you said earlier it was difficult to build a filter that you can move around, right? Yeah. So, so why, so if you're able to apply it selectively to FRF here, why can't you do it differentiate between uh, F1 and F2 a couple of slides ago? Um, yeah. This one? Or, or, or yeah. this one? Um, first one, I think. Yeah, so F, F1 and F2. So you said you can't selectively, it's difficult to implement something to selectively filter just F1 or F2. But yes, right? so, so yeah. this kind of gets into what's called the frequency plan, which is basically choosing the uh, LO and the uh, RF frequencies of interest, like kind of where you're placing them in the spectrum such that you don't get this frequency overlap problem. And so that, that's kind of like a system design thing. So let me write it here. Uh, I'll, I'll erase this and draw a little better one. So like this, and so I'll have, this will be F2. We'll have F1. And then over here, we have FLO. Right? And so, given this configuration, uh, and this is frequency, of course. So, given this configuration, um, and we multiply these two together, we'll have the sum frequencies. So FLO plus F2 and FLO plus F1, which will be off the chart here. But we don't really care about those because they're pretty high frequency. We're interested in the difference frequency here. So we'll have FLO minus F2 and FLO minus F1. And so F, this might be FLO minus one or F1. And this guy here might be F below minus F2, right? Right. Okay. And then I'll have a fixed bandpass filter around uh, F below minus F1. And I'll select this frequency and then I'll do all my modulation based on assuming that I'm receiving within this frequency here, this F below so minus F1. It's easier to do a bandpass filter for FLO minus F1 than to do it for F1. It, well, not necessarily, because now, now suppose I want to receive F2 or the information that's being modulated on the F2 carrier frequency. Right. If I had my bandpass filter, um, so if my bandpass filter was here on the RF frequency F1, I, uh, I would have to move that filter over to F2. Right. 
And like I said, that's difficult. So instead what we can do is keep that filter around FLO minus F1, but now I change FLO. So if I decrease FLO, basically what I'll end up doing, oops. so if I move, I don't know, the scale isn't quite right, but if I move FLO there, then this might turn into FLO minus F1, and this will turn into FLO minus F2. I haven't moved the filter, but I've just moved the LO frequency. Yeah, I guess I guess this it comes down back to like the image frequency problem. Yeah. Um, so it seemed like okay, so you are able to selectively choose uh, whether FLO minus one or FLO minus two is inside the filter, but then um, but then the image for some reason that oh, is I, Yeah, so I see what you're saying. So we, we might have you know signals over here, which when we do the multiplication will end up at these frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not filtering those out. So what you do in practice is you'd have a larger band test filter around the R frequency you're interested in, but you're not singling out a single channel. Okay. So you, then you, getting, yeah. you just assume the noise isn't going to be in, around the frequencies you care about, it, sort of. Uh, yeah. So if they, if you have interference at your like, like very close to your, uh, uh, you know, your channel frequencies, then you're kind of out of luck. You got you got to do something else about it. Mm -hmm. And there's other methods of dealing with it. There's something called processing gain, which is where you can, it's a method of if you know kind of what you're receiving, you can uh, you can kind of differentiate your interference from your actual signal of interest. So that's that's kind of more complicated uh, signal processing techniques. Okay, that makes sense. It, I, it's, yeah, not, I it's not something you to... do, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not something you do that. at the hardware level really. Uh -huh. Um, so like kind of an example of what that would be is, uh, you know, if you have a convolution, for example, say you have just a rectangular pulse, you convolve that with another rectangular pulse, you'll get something that looks like a, you know, a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. You haven't taken, you took yeah, yeah, I, one or two? I, uh, yeah, that's good. Okay. so. And if I convolve, instead of using rectangular pulse, I convolve with like you know, some other random, that's not a function, but you get the point, some other random uh, function. Um, I don't know, something random. Uh, you won't get a triangle, you'll get some other random function, but the peak won't be as high as the triangle. So basically by doing this convolution, you're uh, like, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. I'll, 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 we'll talk about it later. <laughs> all right, works for me. Yeah. Um, all right, so mixing, remember, is multiplication. And multiplication of two signals is not in linear time invariant system. So what I mean by that, uh, remember the definition of linear time invariant systems. One is it has to obey the superposition principle, meaning you apply like twice the input, you get twice the output. Um, and then time invariance, you you delay your input signal if you get a delayed version of the output signal. So why is that not true here? Well, remember that for LTI systems, the output frequency cannot be different than the input frequency. And almost by definition, mixers produce new frequencies um, based on the input. So clearly, they cannot be LTI. However, they are linear. 
So if you imagine you look at this equation here, where this is your LO frequency, this is your RF frequency, from the perspective of the RF frequency, uh, the output is linear. So we double dm. So if we put a two here, we're going to get a two here. However, it's not time invariant because if we change, if we do mega m minus, uh, or like t minus one, for example, then the output won't be shifted by one. It's going to depend on uh, this LO phase, essentially. So you can see it's not time invariant. So in order to create an LTI or a non-LTI circuit, you can't use purely linear time invariant components. And remember that resistors, capacitors, inductors, they're all LTI. So clearly we need some sort of other component and we've been using one this entire time. It's called a transistor. Transistor is pretty nonlinear. And so we can use devices like transistors or diodes to create mixers. But you can't create a mixer just by using uh, transistors, capacitors, and inductors. So there's some key parameters for mixers to keep in mind. And you see, there's a lot of words here, but I'll try to explain them briefly. So one is called the conversion loss or gain. Um, maybe it'll, it'll be loss if you're losing energy. It's going to be gain if you're gaining energy, or power rather. Um, but it's basically the out the ratio of the output uh, to the input. So kind of like the gain of an amplifier. However, the output is a different frequency than the input. So the ratio is just the ratio of the magnitudes of those two frequencies. And here I'll always assume that the IF is the output and RF is the input. Um, but depending on whether you're transmitting or receiving, those might be flipped. Just keep that in mind. And so this uh, property is usually measured in dB decibels. Um, but you could also do it in a linear scale, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, negative decibels is a loss and positive decibels is a gain. So next we have LL isolation. Uh, what that means is suppose we have a mixer, we apply RF on one side, we apply LL on the other side, and we get IF on the output. And so the question is, uh, if the mixer is not perfect, what will happen is some of that LO signal will leak into the IF output. And that's not desirable. So we want to maximize the isolation between the LO port and the output port or the IF port. And so just you know, a, a figure for reference is around 40 dB of isolation is pretty good, meaning if I apply like a, a one volt signal, one volt amplitude signal to the LO port, I'll get a 0 0.01 amplitude 0 0.01 volt amplitude on the IF output uh, on, at the LO frequency. And so there's an analogous figure for RF isolation. It's the same thing, just what's the isolation between the RF port and the IF output. Again, 40 dB is pretty good. Uh, and then we have the LO drive level. So it depends on the type of mixer, but certain types of mixers will require a certain level of the LO signal. So remember when you're designing the oscillator for assignment two, I required an LO uh, amplitude of one volt. And the reason that is, is because the mixers we're gonna be using require an LO drive level of roughly one volt, uh, which uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to the actually building that shortly. Uh, so many commercial, uh, mixers uh, well, often you'll you'll see ring diode mixers. It's one particular type of mixer, but those require roughly seven dBm LO drive level. And if you don't know what dBm is, uh, dBm is um, uh, it's basically thirty minus dB. So if you measure power and measure power reference to a milliwatt. 
and then convert that to decibel scale, that's BBM. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that later if there's time. If not, I'll explain it in the assignment. And then lastly, we have noise figure, which is not a, a property that's limited to only mixers, but a noise figure is a common to any uh, circuit, really. And so what noise figure is, is if you apply a signal on the input and that signal has a certain signal to noise ratio, on the output, you'll get another signal which also has some noise on it. And the question is, did this circuit add any noise from input to output? And so if that signal to noise ratio reduces from input to output, that means that it has a positive noise figure, meaning the circuit is essentially either adding noise or reducing the signal with respect to the noise. And so you want to minimize the noise figure. But we, we won't get into the calculations for this project. We're, we're just we're just going to assume that we're working with relatively high SNR or signal to noise ratio, and we won't have to worry about it. But if you're working with like you know, GPS antennas or something, uh, your signal to noise ratio is really important because the power level of the signals you're receiving is in like the nanowatts or uh, picowatts. So you got to be really careful because the noise might swamp out your signal. All right, so. And then we have single balanced versus double balanced mixers. And you really have to see the circuits to understand why these things come about. But essentially, single balance means you have isolation between either the LO port or the RF port, but not both. Meaning you can achieve a high LO isolation, but not a, any RF isolation or you can achieve a high RF isolation, but not any LO isolation. Um, and then double balance means you're able to achieve both at the same time. You'll have both high LO and RF isolation. You might ask, why would you ever use a single balance mixer? And at low frequencies, which is kind of what we're dealing with, like 27 megahertz is pretty low. Um, you, you can pretty much always go with a double balance mixer and you'll be fine. Um, however, double balance mixers typically have higher noise figures. And they also, it's hard to create them at higher frequencies, like tens of gigahertz, for example. So if you're working at a millimeter wave, which is roughly 30 gigahertz or to well, 30 gigahertz to like 300 gigahertz, um, it's difficult to make a double balance mixer. You can go with a single balance mixer instead. Um, but for this project, we'll use a Double balance mixer. All right. So, okay. So, the type of mix we'll be making is called a diode ring mixer, which is a really, really common type of mixer. And when I said at the beginning that a mixer multiplies two signals together, that's true in some sense. But a diode ring mixer works, or most mixers really, don't work quite like that. So what you actually do is there's really two kind of things you can do. One is you can assume that the, your, your, the circuit you're using has some sort of nonlinearity. Like, for example, if I have a diode, and a diode has an ID characteristic that's exponential, right? Which is definitely nonlinear. So it's something like that. What I can do is if I apply my LO signal to this uh, diode, I'll basically move back and forth along this voltage curve, meaning my current will move up and down. And so uh, your current will basically be an exponential of some function of your LO signal, which is VLO minus cosine of omega LO T. Right. And then suppose we superimpose the RF signal on top of that. 
So in, instead of f just being a function of yellow times cosine omega LOT, you'll get FLO plus the RF times cosine uh, omega RF T. That doesn't look good. Uh, okay. So, so far we just added these two. And remember that adding is a linear time invariant operation. So we could do adding with any linear element. We don't need any nonlinear stuff for that. So we can add those voltages together. And uh, the current basically takes the exponential of that. And remember that we can write any or most function in terms of a Taylor series expansion. So this is equal to um, constant term plus you know, A1, which is your Taylor series uh, coefficients, you know, A2 times X squared and so on. And if we look at A0, that's constant. If we look at A1 times X, that's just A1 times the LO plus the RF. So that's nothing special. But if you look at the X squared term, we're going to have the LO term squared plus the RF term squared plus two times the LO times the RF term. So in the X squared term, we've essentially multiplied the two signals together, right? And that's mixing two signals together. So if we can get rid of all the other terms, then we're left with the mixing term and our sum and difference frequencies, and we've essentially made a mixer. And if you go through all the math, uh, you'll, you'll find out that it involves like some modified first order Bessel functions of the first kind. So it's, the math can be kind of complicated, but if you go through the math, uh, it does work out. So it's possible. <laughs> So that, that's one way to make a mixer. The other way, which is kind of what this ring mixer is doing, and hopefully that explanation made some sense. But suppose we take our, and that, that, uh, if you look at the figures at the bottom here, suppose we take our RF signal, which is this guy here, and suppose we made our LO signal a square wave instead of a sinusoid. And then we multiplied the two together. We'll get some mess, which is the, this guy here. And the mess will consist of um, the LO signal, which is really the LO frequency and its harmonics, times the RF signal, right? So essentially what we're doing here is we're Flipping the, the like flipping the phase of the RF signal 180 degrees every half period of the LO signal. Right, we're switching back and forth by multiplying by the square wave, and that's essentially what the output looks like. Now the question is, what does that look like in the frequency domain? Well, I, I did the MATLAB program for you to find out. So here I have the RF. Uh, signal in the frequency domain. So I just have one peak at uh, one hertz. In, the, in this case, the one hertz sinusoid. The LO is a 10 hertz square wave. So I have one frequency component, which is this guy. That's the fundamental at 10 hertz. And I have harmonics of the 10 hertz. So this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and so on. And if you've gone through the math before, this roll up here kind of follows the sync function. So you, as you keep going higher in frequency, the harmonics get smaller and smaller. Now, if you multiply the two together, remember that multiplying in the time domain is equivalent to a convolution in the frequency domain. 
So we're just convolving this one hertz signal with each of these harmonics. And at each of the harmonics, we'll get a sum and difference frequency. So here we have nine hertz. Here we have 11 hertz. Here we have uh, uh, 29 hertz. Here we have 31 hertz and so on. We have uh, 49, 51. And remember that a square root doesn't have even harmonics. So we only have the odd, odd harmonics. So that's why we skip 20 and 40 and so on. So that, that's the theory behind this uh, ring mixer. Any questions about that? Um, yeah. So I think um, in your previous lecture, you said we don't like using uh, square waves for our oscillator because it was like a, you, have, you have the odd harmonics, but here you, you seem to enjoy using them or not enjoy <laughs> like, yeah, you use them in this example. So it's kind of like, I'm not yeah. sure why we don't use square waves then. Right, so um, in terms of oscillators, we don't want to really have a square wave oscillator. Um, in, in general, making them kind of reduces your the quality factor, uh, your oscillator, not the quality factor, I mean the phase modes of the oscillator. Um, so let me see if I can explain it well. So, so the more square, like particularly for a Colpitz oscillator, the more square your output is, it tends to follow that the phase noise of that oscillator increases, meaning like the frequency jitter is worse. And that'll cause problems for the communication system. But uh, for in general, if you have a square wave in your system, those higher frequency components can cause problems. Uh, so for this mixer example, the square wave is kind of what we want, but for any, like any general uh, circuit, like an amplifier, if you have these higher order harmonics, uh, what can happen is that uh, due to nonlinearities, these higher order harmonics can down convert themselves to lower frequencies and they might interfere with your actual signal. And I haven't talked about this yet, but or I probably never will. <laughs> but if you look at the gain of a amplifier versus the input power or in input voltage rather, it's gonna be linear, or I shouldn't say gain, this is V out. It'll be linear up to a certain point, right? And then once the output gets large enough, then the game will start to saturate and compress. So it'll kind of look like this. Eventually the, the amplifier will stop amplifying. And this is the same Taylor series expansion thing I explained earlier happens here where uh, instead of V out being just a portional to V in, you'll have to take the Taylor series expansion of this function here, the V out over V in function. And if you're applying a square wave to that, you're, you're essentially mixing like components of the square wave together, like the different frequency components. And so you might mix the 10 Hertz component here with the 30 Hertz component, and that'll mix to 20 and 40 and so on. So you can see that like things will get kind of iffy if you use square waves. <laughs> so hopefully that answers the question. So is that just with like the Colpitz oscillator? Well, the, this is with the amplifier, not even okay, okay. an oscillator. Right. Okay. And also, like if you're working at say gigahertz, one gigahertz, and you're using a square wave, square waves will extend far into higher frequencies. So instead of like a fundamental of 10 hertz, you might have one gigahertz fundamental, and then your next higher harmonic will be three gigahertz. And your circuit might operate in, uh, uh, in some fashion at one gigahertz, 
can be completely different at three gigahertz. And that completely different circuit might uh, affect the operation of the entire system. But if you're careful with just the diode ring mixer, you can use a square wave. And I should also mention, uh, if you take a sinusoid, which looks like this, right? And then you amplify it to oblivion, it will turn into something like this. And excuse my really bad drum. <laughs> but from a circuit perspective, if you just kind of chop it off here and chop it off here, you've essentially made a square wave, right? And so that's kind of what's happening inside this ring mixer. If you assume that the LO voltage is high enough, then it looks like a square wave, even if it is sinusoidal. All right, so now we get to the actual ring mixer. So here's a schematic of it. And I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability here. So for now, let's ignore this stuff here and just focus on the left side of this uh, schematic. So we have the LO port here on the left, and we have four diodes. And hopefully you remember how transformers work. Well, do speak up if you don't. <laughs> but suppose we have an LO signal that looks like this. And that means and the, the primary of the transformer is connected to the input. And then the secondary is kind of split into two parts. So the secondary is what's called center tapped at the middle, which is this portion right here. We're connecting that to ground. And so what's going to happen is if we feed in the signal over here, we're just going to get something that looks like this. And over here, we're going to get something that's 90 degrees, or sorry, 180 degrees out of phase. Right? So far, so good. I assume that's a yes. So now let's see what ha what's happening in the circuit here. Uh, so during the half, the positive cycle, well, positive half of the cycle, what's going to happen is D3 and D4, these two diodes, they, they're not going to conduct any current, right? Because they're reverse biased. We have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here. So instead, D1 and D2 are going to be forward biased. So we're going to get current flowing through here and back around. Okay, so so far so good. And then during the negative half of the cycle, D1 and D2 are going to be reverse bias, and D4 and D3 are going to be forward bias, which means we're going to get current flowing this way. Right? Okay, so, so far so good. So now, Let's take a look at the other side of the circuit, the RF part. We kind of have a similar arrangement. We have the primary of this transformer connected to RF. And then on the secondary, we have a center tap, and we're calling that the IF port. And then one side of the transformer is connected to this point, and the other side is connected to this point here. Okay, so now let's assume for now that D3 and D4 are not are for reverse bias, and D1 and D2 are forward bias. So if I have the RF signal, which is over here, that's a terrible looking fine wave. Hold on. If I have my RF signal, let's say it looks like that. And uh, I'll have the same thing over here. 
you'll have negative copy over here. And so what's going to happen? Um, well, remember that D3 and D4 can't conduct any current because they're reverse biased by the LO. And I, I forgot to mention, we, we're making the assumption that the LO voltage is much larger than the RF voltage. So because D1 and D2 are forward biased by the LO signal, um, the RF signal is not going to reverse bias those diodes. OK. So uh, basically, no current is going to flow through the lower half of the transformer because it's blocked by D3 and D4. So instead, current is going to have to flow through the top half of the transformer. And it's going to go along this path here. It's going to go through here and then either both up and down through D2 and D1. And it's going to go through here to ground. And then the uh, question is, where is that? Uh, the current has to come from somewhere. And it's going to come from the IF port here. So really, you're going to have signal going one way through the IF port. And it's going to end up going to ground. OK. So does that, that make sense to everyone? And of course, it can also go up this path here and down here. So, so far, so good, hopefully. Sure. Okay. So now let's say the LO signal flips polarity. And now instead of D3 and D4 being forward bias or reverse bias, now D1 and D2 are reverse bias, so they're not conducting any current. And now I'm going to get current that flows uh, uh, basically from ground down here, up through here, and into the IF port. <laughs> and of course, also the, the other way up here through D3. down here. So essentially what we've done is depending on which pair of diodes are being turned on, we're changing which direction current is flowing through the IF port. Right, so we're, every time the LO signal goes from positive to negative or negative to positive, we're flipping the polarities of D1 and D2 and D3 and D4. Which, which is in turn flipping which direction the current is flowing through the IF port. And so essentially what we're doing is the LO is controlling the phase of the RF signal going through the IF port, which is multiplying by a square wave, right? Which goes from one to minus one. All right, so that's how the mixer works. Any question? Yeah, so just to clarify, so LO is just basically, since its voltage is much higher than RF, it um, controls which direction um, RF is going to flow in or out through IF. And then that right. base, uh, OK. Mm -hmm. And when I say in or out of IF, um, because the RF signal is an AC signal, and so it flows both directions, what I really mean right. is that there's a 180 degree phase shift. All right. OK. So uh, now the other question is, what is the, I mean, we're feeding in an LO voltage. We're feeding in an RF voltage. Do we see the LO and the RF on the IF port? which is to say, is there isolation between the LO and the IF and the RF and the IF? And I remember, remember that I said that the ring mixer is a type of double balanced mixer, which means that there shouldn't be any leakage from LO and RF to IF. So let's verify that. So uh, if you kind of look at, let me clean this up a little. <clears throat> 
All right. So this point here and this point here, from uh, if we're only looking at the LO voltage, they're 180 degrees out of phase, right? They're opposites of each other. Because when the bottom goes negative, the top goes positive. So if you apply like a plus one volt here and a minus one volt here, and assuming these diodes are identical, you should get zero volts here, right? And so at all, 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 at all times, uh, the LO is going to create zero volts at this point here. And by the same reasoning, you're going to get zero voltage here. So this is going to be zero volts as well from the LO perspective. And if you have zero volts across this inductor, that means you're going to have zero volts here at the IF which means you're going to get zero LO signal going to the IF. So we have perfect isolation from the LO to the IF. So now let's look at the RF, make sure we get the same thing. So the RF signal is going to be positive here on the top. And then at the bottom, it's going to be the same thing in the opposite phase, so 180 degrees out of phase. And if this transformer, this inductor essentially is perfect, then our center tap is exactly in the center, then there should be zero volts here due to the RF signal, right? Which means that we have zero RF signal going to the IF port. So with this configuration, assuming that D1, D2, D3, D4, and the transformers are all perfect, uh, then we have perfect isolation between LO, RF, and IF. So that's good. In reality, what happens is the diodes might not be perfectly matched, like their exponential characteristics would be slightly different, meaning like the voltage here won't be exactly zero volts, but you know, pretty close to zero volts. And so that's why I said that you know 40 dB is a good isolation figure um, because you'll never achieve perfect isolation. There will always be some leakage. And so 40 dB, which is you know you're dropping the voltage by 100, that's pretty good. All right, so here is a remixer I built actually, and so you can see the two transformers. Uh, this is the RF transformer. And this is the LO transformer. The reason why they're different sizes is because that's just what I happen to have on hand. <laughs> they don't have to be different sizes. And then these, this guy here is a diode, or two diodes actually. And this here, these little black packages, that's another two diodes. They're pretty small. <laughs> and what I'm doing here, the, 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 this oscilloscope picture, is the IF output. And if you look, it's pretty similar to the uh, you know, theoretical, uh, this thing here, the theoretical IF output when, when you multiply a square wave times the uh, RF sinusoid. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, let's see. I mean, so it's not perfect, exactly the same because uh, the uh, LO is not a perfect square wave. It's just a really big sinusoid, but it's pretty close, I'd say. All right, so that, that's eventually what we'll be designing. So what do you want to keep in mind when you design one of these mixers? You might notice that there's not much room for you know, design choice like the amplifiers. So there's not really much, you know, there's no resistors to choose. There's no bias current. Um, but what, what you got to be sure of is that the diodes are matched and that'll improve your isolation. You want to ensure that the transformer windings are symmetric, like I said, also to improve the isolation. And you got to make sure that the LO uh, signal level is high enough that you're fully biasing those diodes into forward conduction and that your RF signal is not going to you know, swap out your LO signal. So if I go back to the schematic here, uh, for standard diodes, 
you know, the forward voltage of a diode, right, is around you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. So if we were to use standard diodes, you need the LO voltage to be uh, basically a diode drop, right? Because you basically have twice the LO voltage across these uh, uh, diodes because of the transformer. So like if I if this is one volt here, this will be one volt here. This will be minus one volt here. And one volt minus one minus minus one volt is two volts. So from this point here to this point here, you'll have, you know, from here to here, it'll be two volts. Right. And uh, that'll fully bias these two diodes in the forward conduction. So that's good. Remember that our LO from the oscillator you designed has an amplitude of one volt. So that'll work perfectly here. You could go lower. Um, and in practice, you usually use shot key diodes, not standard diodes. And so shot key diodes have a forward voltage of you know, roughly like 0.3 volts to 0.4 volts. So you can definitely go lower. But you want your LO voltage to be high enough such that it looks like a square wave almost. All right, so that's how you find the LO, the required LO drive level. Um, but if you make the LO drive level too high, then the problem you'll find is that because there's finite isolation between the LO and the IF, increasing the drive level past a certain point will just increase the level of LO going to the IF port. And that will be helpful at all. All right, and then the last thing is that you want to determine how much inductance you need on the transformers. So let me go back here. Uh, the, what, what, what I did here is assume that these transformers are perfect, which is to say that they have infinite inductance and perfect coupling from winding to winding. But in reality, you never actually get that. So we got to make sure that our transformers are adequate. So when I look into this here, this uh, uh, this port, what I'm going to see is the inductance of this winding, as well as the impedance looking to this side, transformed uh, to the primary. And I won't go into the math here, but essentially what you want to do is remember that you're, you're going to be driving this by some voltage source with its own series resistance. So this will be your, your, uh, oops, your internal resistance. I'll call it RS. And you want to make sure that uh, the impedance looking into this transform is high enough such that you're not loading down the uh, source LO voltage due to this uh, you know, voltage dividing effect between the source resistor and the inductor. So what you want to do is make the, the reactance of the winding inductance roughly like uh, 10 times larger than RS. And that's just a, a good rule of thumb to use. So if RS is 50 ohms, you're going to want to make the, uh, uh, the reactance of the winding, which is omega L. You want to make this roughly like 500 ohms or higher. OK. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Okay, thank you for the confirmation. All right, so now the question is how do we actually uh, put a transformer or simulate one in LP Spice, which is, of course, we're gonna, what we're going to be using. And so let me show you how to do that here. I made a nice little uh, thing for this. I can find it. Uh, 
transformer. There it is. So what I've done here is essentially I have a uh, primary side of the transformer, L1. And then on the secondary, I have L2 in series with L3. And I center tap the transformer to the ground. And then on the output, I have two resistors. And then where the special part comes in is this little guy right here, the K1, L1, L2, L3, 1. And so how do you make that? Well, we just press this button up here that says spice directive. It says dot op. And you just type that in. You type in K1, L1, L2, L3, and you can just plot that down anyway. So what this means, K1 is the spice notation for a mutual inductance, which is what a transformer is. It's just mutual inductor. And then you list first the primary, which is L1. And then you list uh, the secondaries. So L2, which is this guy, and then L3, which is the bottom guy. And then one is what's called the coupling factor between the, the inductances. And you can just leave that at one for now. Um, for the uh, uh, type of transformers that we can make, it'll be pretty close to one. It won't be exactly one, but one signifies perfect coupling. We can't achieve perfect coupling. So I'm going to simulate this. I'm going to ask some questions to make sure you understand what's going on here. So I have a one volt amplitude sine wave here, 10 megahertz. It's just an arbitrary uh, uh, frequency. Now, question is, what is the voltage at V1? Somebody answer that. One volt? Yes. If I plot that, see it's basically right on top of uh, the, the input. Now, what about V3? Negative one. Volt. Yes. So everybody else understand that? Yeah, because they're 180 out of phase. Right. Okay. So V3 is the red guy, so that's 180 degrees out of phase with the other two. Now, what about V2? I want to say zero. Does everyone else want to say zero? Yeah, screw it. Zero. Okay, no, no, no one else wants to say anything. So yeah, it's zero. <laughs> okay, so that's good. And then if I change this to two kilo ohms, V1 uh, and V3, will those change? No. Okay, and what about V2? I'm not sure. I'm tempted to say zero again, but I don't know why. Okay, well, if V1 and V3 haven't changed, then all we right. have is a voltage divider between V1 and V3, right? Mm -hmm. And we have one, two. So uh, basically, uh, the voltage across uh, R1 and R2 is two volts amplitude. And we're going to be dividing that where uh, mm -hmm. two thirds is going to be across R2 and one third is going to be across R1. Okay. Right. Not zero. Right. Oh. Um, oh, I didn't simulate it. <laughs> so if I go like this, I'm getting uh, one point, whatever that is, 1.3 or so. Um, across R2 and then across R1, I'm getting the other third. And if I go across both of them, I have two volts amplitude, right? Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Yep. Okay. 
Anyone have any questions about that? Because you'll, you'll need to understand this to make a mixer. Can you repeat one more time what K1 means in the spice directive? Yeah, K1 is just, uh, it, it's, it begins the command for mutual inductance. Okay, got it. Yeah. That's all. So if you had multiple transformers, you'd have like, like copy this guy. Oops. So here's one transformer, and then the second one would have to make this K2. And this is L4, L5, L6. So I'd have to change these to L4, L5, and L6. And then here's my second transformer. Okay. Um, okay, the last thing I want to do here is you'll need diodes, right? So let me so the, the shortcut for diode, you just press B, that brings up a diode. Or you can go up here and press the diode button. And then of course you have to give it a model for your diode because diodes, um, each one has a different characteristic. And so Spice gives you tons of options ranging from your, you know, your commonplace one in uh, 914 or 4148, those are pretty common. Um, for this project, uh, I, I have the SPICE model for the particular transistor, so I'll post that on the assignment uh, for this uh, lecture. And you'll enter it in the same way you did for the uh, MMBTH10 transistor. But for the, if you just want to experiment, uh, you can just like choose most of these Shockey diodes, like the 5117, 1N5117s. Fine. Um, most of these shocky diodes will work fine. Just don't use like a Zener diode <laughs> or an LED. Those will not work fine. Okay. And then if you choose one, it'll just show up on your schematic and you can just pull up the diode wherever you want. Okay. Um, so if I go back. So there's different. Uh, okay, so there's different types of mixers. I showed you a ring mixer. However, there is many other types. So on the left here is what's called a Gilbert cell, named after a guy named Gilbert. I like the name. Uh, so it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. And if you're interested, I can explain it. But uh, it, it's also a type of double balanced mixer, but unlike the um, diode ring mixer, the Gilbert cell can provide gain, while the diode ring mixer can only provide loss because it's a passive circuit. Gilbert cell is an active circuit, has strange whiskers. Um, and then the other one I wrote, I posted here is a single diode mixer. So instead of four diodes, we have one. And this is kind of how what, what I explained with the Taylor series expansion. So you'll feed in uh, here, let me feed in the yellow signal over here, the RF signal over here, and then this thing called a diplexer essentially adds the two. Um, it's kind of like two filters in parallel, but uh, basically adds the two together. And they come out here, and they both go into the diode. And then the, that diode will generate the mixing uh, product in the, in the current. And that current is going to flow from this end here. And that's going to flow through the load resistor, oops, which is going to be your uh, mixing current. It's going to go down through here. So, hope that makes sense. Uh, we won't be using the single bio mixer though. And then notice um, because there's no uh, the single diode mixer is not a double balance mixer. So there's no real isolation between the LO and the RF and the load here, the IF output here is the IF. The, the only isolation is going to be due to this IF filter, but that's not going to provide perfect isolation. Okay, so um, I'll scratch this for now because <laughs> I'll, I'll change some things around. <laughs> 
Uh, so for the third assignment, you're going to create a ring mixer in LT Spice. And uh, if you treat it for, uh, like if, if you apply ideal one megahertz and 28 megahertz signals to the RF and uh, uh, LO ports, you should be able to produce 27 megahertz and 29 megahertz. So remember, those are the difference in the sum frequency. And then once you get that working, you'll be able to use the oscillator that you built from assignment two, and you can drive the mixer using that 28 megahertz oscillator and uh, uh, get that mixing action going on. Uh, but note that you'll be also need to design a buffer, which is the same amplifier between the oscillator and the mixer. And the reason you need to do that is because if you just stick the uh, mixer directly onto the oscillator output, you will basically load down the output of the oscillator and that won't play nice with the oscillation. Um, so in general, you, you usually need a buffer. Sometimes you don't, but usually you do. Uh, and then second part for this assignment, which uh, I'll introduce after the next lecture, is because you have this 27 megahertz and the 29 megahertz, and we're only interested in the 27 megahertz frequency, not the 29 megahertz frequency, we need to be able to filter out this 29 megahertz stuff so that we're only left with 27. So we're going to be introduced to our filters. And we're going, I'm also going to talk about impedance matching uh, using uh, LC matching networks and other stuff. <laughs> All right, so I hope this stuff to look forward to. All right, so any, any questions? Yeah, I have some questions. Yes, sir. Um, so I guess this kind of goes back to slide 12 with the square wave. Like for, or at least for example, you, you input a, a sine wave, right? And I was kind of confused on why uh, we didn't input like a square wave. And that kind of leads into the question of why do we need like the harmonics of the square wave? Because if we put in like a sine wave, like you did in the example, we get the sum and difference frequencies uh, from just like one spike on, or I guess it's not slide 12, uh, slide 13, next one. Okay. Yeah, like, if, okay, if you input a sine wave for your LO, you only get one like delta. You don't get all these harmonics, right? Yeah, I was a little confused about that as well. Yeah, like, are there, is there a purpose for the harmonics and why we use a square wave? Uh, so you're asking why we even bother, why I bothered showing you the square wave thing, right? Yeah, I guess if, if we're using a sine wave. Right, so um, if I go to the mixer itself, uh, yes, we're in inserting a sine wave. However, it's acting like a square wave in the sense that it's either switching on uh, these two pairs of uh, diodes or these two, um, if, if the LO signal is large enough. And from the perspective of the RF, it's basically switching rapidly between the two states, which okay. is like multiplying by a square wave. Right. Okay. So wait. So do you still get the harmonic sum and difference frequencies at the output? Yes, you do. Okay. Okay. So I guess if you go back to the last slide for assignment three, we'll get twenty-seven megahertz and twenty-nine megahertz, but then we'll get like a bunch of other sum and difference frequencies. Yeah. If you um, you'll have fifty. What is that? Uh, okay. 55 and 59 or 55 and 57 megahertz is the next harmonic. Um, you won't I have the, you, you ideally won't have the even harmonics, but because nothing's perfect, you will have even harmonics. <laughs> so okay, I, yeah. ideally you'd start with third harmonic. That makes sense. And like, we don't really care about those. So we just filter those out. Yeah. So the, those okay. are pretty easy to filter out because they're so high in yeah. frequency. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my other question was um, for, I guess for this particular case, do we need to design a buffer in between our oscillator and mixer? Because our mixer, or sorry, our oscillator, the cold pit oscillator from assignment two, mm -hmm. the output, uh, output impedance, we, we try to make it 50 ohms, right? And then if we just make our, uh, like the input impedance into the transformer, 50 ohms, like don't, we don't need a buffer. Is that, is that the case or? Well, so the, the oscillator wants to see a very high impedance and the input impedance to the buffer won't be 50 ohms. It'll be much higher. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, te technically you could um, drive the mixer directly with the oscillator. Uh, however, in general, that's not really advised because um, there, there's something called load pulling, and what that what that'll do is like sh slightly shift the frequency of oscillation due to whatever load you have on the oscillator, and it'll change the amplitude too. So okay. your your buffer will have a high input impedance, but it'll have a low yep. output impedance. So it's safer in general to use a buffer. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, and thanks. Note that the output impedance of the buffer doesn't have to be 50 ohms. That, that was just relatively arbitrary for that particular assignment. But um, uh, for the mixer, you can have the output impedance be lower. The output impedance of the buffer, that is. Because the, like, what, what, what load is the, the um, buffer seeing? It's going to be looking into this transformer. And so, oh, that's yeah, that's high. Well, it, it, if the inductance is high impedance, then all you're seeing is what's on the secondary being uh, transformed back to the input. So, like, if I have a, a simple transform, like, oops, yeah. if I have a transformer like this. And I connect the secondary to just a resistor. And if I assume the inductances are um, infinite, then this is just equivalent to a resistor that's transformed by this transformation ratio here. So this might be like n to one, right? Okay. So. Um, now the question is, what is this resistor in this circuit? Well, it's basically two diodes in series. And so what we're kind of doing is like shorting out the LO every uh, half cycle by these two diodes. And shorting out an oscillator, it's not going to make it very happy. So that, that's why you need the buffer there. So the oscillator, oh, if we connected directly, the oscillator would like C from the output and it would see like changing very or uh, changing resistances like that's where you're trying to say like sometimes it go down to the short and then sometimes uh, I, I wouldn't call it changing because okay if, if you were to take the Fourier transform of the like the effective input impedance and you only looked at the LO frequency uh, LO component of that input impedance it would be fixed but it, it'll oh. be a pretty small number. So like diodes are nonlinear, right? And so you can't like assign a particular okay. uh, resistance to them, but you, you can assign an effective resistance um, that like- uh, Linearizing a diode. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. It's not, it's not yeah. quite the same thing, but yeah, kind of like that. Okay. Okay, interesting. It ends up being some vessel function actually. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks, David. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, then we'll then we'll call it a day. You succeeded. Well, I, I have a time. question on assignment two. <laughs> yes, sir. Two hours <laughs> implies I didn't finish it, but um. Uh, is there um, 
a function for the output amplitude? Uh, uh, there, there is, but it's not nice. <laughs> okay, so just for the assignment, you want us just to play around and just like kind I of asked, eyeball it? I asked okay. David this question and he yeah. said, just play with okay, just play okay. the resistors. Good luck with that. I can do that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it, you just need to change RE to something small enough. Yeah. And the amplitude will be large enough. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay, perfect. If, if you did want to actually find the amplitude, you'd have to go through the full like, nonlinear analysis of the transistor. And that's not fun. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot harder than you know, the linearization stuff you've been doing. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anything else? One, five, four, three, two, one, okay.